Well, a very warm welcome uh, to this last of our, our three-part lecture series on the meeting place Christianity and culture in early Toronto. And this evening we are looking at the uh, role of the churches with regards to the social safety net as it evolved here in the city. It's very, very easy to forget that the city of Toronto and indeed this entire province of Ontario was established initially as a haven for refugees. So if you look at your second slide, I guess after the title slide, the 7,500 loyalists who fled the, United, the new United States after the Peace of Paris in 1783 coming to what is now Ontario came with very little after forfeiting all their farms and fo homesteads back in New York and Pennsylvania and all the other uh, American colonies. If you move on to the next slide, you'll see that often destitute or near destitution, many of these loyalists had no other recourse than to plead with the colonial officials here for financial support, causing one author to rather waggishly refer to the loyalists as Canada's first welfare recipients, which is not exactly the way we often think of the loyalists. Surviving petitions from the loyalists addressed to the lieutenant governors of Upper Canada in the late 18th and early 19th century, such as the one that you are looking there at there now, seek compensation and financial support from the British government, not only for the loss of their old lands back in the United States, but also for clothing and books, furniture and personal effects that had been seized by the Americans. Upper Canada very quickly became a place where it was expected that some kind of community support was going to be necessary if a place like York, which would of course become Toronto, and the immigrants who populated it were not just going to survive, but were actually going to thrive. So the history of social welfare in Toronto, and really across what would become Canada in those decades before Confederation in 1867, has I think rightly been described as a sharing of responsibility between public and private bodies. And that remains, when you think about it, the enduring characteristic of social welfare in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, to the present day, with churches still playing their very, very active part. Moving on, in 1837, the colonial parliament, which met here in York, passed one of the very first pieces of legislation that specifically targeted social welfare, and that was the House of Industry Act. This act allowed taxes to be raised to support the establishment of such houses in Toronto and elsewhere for the poor and for the indigent. Now, if you recall your Dickens, you will know that houses of industry are not places you wanted to end up. Their British counterparts were effectively prisons and escaping their demoralizing grip was nigh on impossible. Looking at the next image, you'll see that in order to preempt such a place ever being established in Toronto, some Protestant ministers collaborated with political reformers to establish the Toronto House of Industry, which operated for more than 100 years. But the difference was, from its British counterpart, that it was based on more humane principles and eventually, over its years of service, eventually became a home for poor seniors in 1948. So it had rather a long history of helping the poor. And while poor relief bills were introduced throughout the middle of the 19th century, in fact, there wasn't a lot of political activity on this front in terms of helping the poor in Toronto. What the city council and the provincial governments did do, however, and this is important, was they provided a legal framework as well as the financial resources to allow for the proliferation of voluntary organizations, such as the large number, which were administered by local churches, Anglican, Protestant, and Catholic, from, as I say, the middle of the 19th century right through to today when you think about it. 
perhaps in part owing to the memory of the challenges that had been experienced by those, those very first American loyalist refugees at the end of the 18th century, assistance with the resettlement of immigrants was going to become a priority in Toronto, then lasting right through the 19th century, and when you think about it, what is happening right down today with including our Afghanistan, Afghanistan refugees and now our Ukrainian refugees. And waves and waves of refugees over the decades have made their way to Toronto. Moving on, beginning as early as the 1830s, the St. George's and the St. Andrew's societies were established here in Toronto as philanthropic organizations that were specifically mandated to help those who had come to Toronto from their homes in England, Wales, and Scotland, often arriving here in Toronto in utter poverty. Those two societies provided medical care, food, and financial support as were needed Technically, they were non-sectarian, but in fact, both had very close, albeit informal ties, to the Anglican and Presbyterian churches here in Toronto, as well as their ministers. The St. George's Society, which is the oldest philanthropic society in the city of Toronto, it collaborated with the Anglican church to ensure that any Englishman or Welshman who died without sufficient funds could be buried free of charge in consecrated ground, which they were. Moving to the next slide, the St. Andrew Society, which had a similarly close association with the Presbyterian Church in Toronto, did the very same thing, establishing a rather large grave site, which you can still see, for the Scottish poor, but up in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Moving on then, in 1841, just in time for the huge, huge mass immigration of Irish to Toronto, a St. Patrick Society was established with a board that was actually composed both of Protestants and Catholics. And their aim was to aid with the resettlement and other needs associated with the immigrants coming from that poor country to our shores. Now, unfortunately, the cooperation between the Catholics and the Protestants within the St. Patrick Society appears to have faltered during the 1850s and afterwards. So rival Irish benevolent societies were eventually established that divided clearly, very clearly on sectarian lines, just as they had been back in the old country. So these Irish societies that emerged they all had very close ties to their respective churches, Catholic or Protestant, ensuring that immigrants would not be drawn, and this was the key thing, that these immigrants would not be drawn into accepting charity from those who did not share their own faith traditions. Whatever the history, the point of these societies, St. George's, St. Andrew's, St. Patrick's, was to ensure that resettlement went as smoothly as possible, and also that the ties to culture and religion were maintained. It is the Irish immigration, however, that more than anything else was going to lay bare the weaknesses that you would find in the social fabric of our city. If you look at the next slide, as noted last week, St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church it had been established to serve the needs of the growing Catholic population in 1822, but Little Trinity Anglican Church on King Street, it had also been established in the very same neighborhood for the evangelical Irish Protestants who had been arriving in Toronto since the 1820s and 1830s. Moving on then, the year 1847, well, that was going to prove to be a watershed moment in the history of social services in Toronto, or more to the point, the lack of social services in Toronto. Now think about this statistic. Between May and October of 1847, at the height of the potato famine, 38,560 Irish famine refugees Protestant and Catholic 
disembarked in Toronto. Why is that significant? Because the population of Toronto in 1847 was only 20,000. The refugees coming from Ireland in 1847 well outnumbered the residents of this city. For the most part, the passage for these immigrants had initially been paid by their Irish landlords, and they had done it not out of generosity, but it was an easy way to empty their lands of humans and repopulate them with more profitable grazing animals, especially cows and sheep. The Irish refugees of 1847, they were now Toronto's problem. So while the refugees may have arrived in Toronto free of debt, they also arrived with next to nothing, and their overwhelming poverty only increased with the refusal by many Toronto businessmen to offer work to these poorest of the poor with signs in their windows saying, no Irish need apply despite the overwhelming sympathy that was expressed for these Irish refugees in the local newspapers of the day. If you move on to the next image, to make matters worse, disease also came with these Irish immigrants. Michael Power, who we spoke about last week, the great Catholic Bishop of Toronto, he had been in Ireland recruiting clergy for the city earlier in 1847, and he came back to the city with a warning for Toronto's politicians that the Irish were coming, and they were coming in huge numbers, and the situation was dire. So what the city did was it set up a triage center for the immigrants arriving at the port, and then they began erecting sheds in which to house the sick, and thereby prevent them from entering the city and bringing contagion with them. Moving on, by June of 1847, it was clear that the immigration officials down in Kingston, they were actually sending typhus victims on to Toronto knowing that they had typhus. By the end of 1847, 1,186 migrants had died and they were buried in charity graves either at St. James's Cemetery on Parliament Street or in the cemetery that surrounded old St. Paul's Catholic Church on Queen Street. And among the dead was Dr. George Grissett, the brother of the Dean of St. James, who volunteered in June of 1847 to be the attending physician at the fever sheds but he died just one month later. Also among the dead, the great bishop, Michael Power, the Catholic Bishop of Toronto, who died after contracting typhus during his twice daily visits to those fever sheds. If you look to the next slide, you can see that a monument to Bishop Power stands to this day outside of St. Paul's Basilica on Queen Street. And a new monument to Dr. Grisset well, it's commemorated in a park that now bears his name at the corner of Adelaide and Widmer Streets, where the immigrant hospital originally stood. The devastating effects of a crisis that had been caused by the Irish famine immigrants laid bare the broader crisis in health care and social welfare in Toronto in general. Now, the churches they did what they could to bring what relief they could. But how exactly, when you think about it, do you care for the needs of your population when there is no real infrastructure in place? There are few schools, let alone medical schools. There are fewer hospitals. And health care, which we have forgotten in the last 60 years, was a pay-per-service basis. And in the missionary period, which I spoke about last week, pre-1850, there was still no strong, centralized, ecclesiastical organizational structure to coordinate the efforts of clergy and laity alike, whether Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian, or Methodist. There was nothing really to coordinate those efforts on behalf of the relief of the poor. So what happens is we first see some sort of organized effort to change the situation, not surprisingly, within the Catholic community. 
given the fact that the vast majority of these Irish immigrants who had come to Toronto were, of course, Catholics. Now, while Bishop Power had already recruited the Sisters of Loretto to come to Toronto from Ireland to begin teaching both poor children as well as the daughters of wealthier Catholics who were paying tuition, education, as important as it was, was not then the priority. In 1847, 1850 and onwards, it was health care that was the priority. And it's at this point then we turn to the work of the Sisters of St. Joseph. If you look at the next slide, the first sisters arrived in Toronto on the 7th of October, 1851, at the invitation of Toronto's second Catholic bishop, Bishop de Charbonnel. And they were charged specifically to provide for the needs of the poor. They immediately took charge of a Catholic orphanage that had been set up already on Jarvis Street. But six years later, in 1857, the sisters opened the House of Providence near Parliament and Queen Streets, which became the largest charitable institution in the city at that time. The House of Providence served as a residence for the elderly, a home for orphans, a home for the poor, a hospital for the sick, and a refuge for immigrants. All were welcome to free beds and free meals, no matter what their religion was. The directory for the city of Toronto in 1859, it aptly described the House of Providence as a place for, quote, the indigent, the superannuated, and emigrants. The wide variety of services that were offered at the House of Providence from the very beginning reflected Bishop de Charbonnel's vision of a center where the poor could be cared for from cradle to grave as needed. In the early years, the Sisters of St. Joseph went door to door, soliciting donations from Protestants and Catholics alike and taking in laundry, which they then washed and themselves returned to their homes in order to fund this enterprise. Over time, the sisters built a separate house for the poor and indigent men on their property, and new wings to the House of Providence were then added in 1875 and 1881, and by 1890, there were 530 permanent residents in the House of Providence, not including the 30 nuns who served as nurses and superintendents and administrators. In 1870, the sisters began running a place called the St. Nicholas Home for Newsboys, where working lads who lived rough on the streets of Toronto, hawking papers during the day and sadly sometimes prostituting themselves by night, could be fed and cared for safely by the nuns. At about the same time, the sisters also opened the Notre Dame des Âges Home for girls who would come to the city to find work but who also needed a safe place to live. Looking at the next slide, 1875, another congregation of nuns, the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, they opened a house in Toronto for prostitutes, the notorious Magdalene Laundries, to help women who were trying to get off the streets and get back to normal life, though admittedly now, with perspective, we can see that these were far from ideal settings for this enterprise. Moving on again to the next image, the crowning image without doubt in this field of early social welfare by Catholic nuns came in 1892 when the Sisters of St. Joseph founded St. Michael's Hospital, again intended as a free hospital for the poor. With 110 beds, at the time it was the second largest hospital in the city and it was open to anyone of any religion or no religion. Each one of these endeavors that I've just described gives us just a small taste, not only of the work the nuns were doing, but really of the social problems that were being faced by the disadvantaged in Toronto during the mid and the late 19th centuries. Moving to the next slide. The Anglican Sisterhood of St. John the Divine they may have arrived later in Toronto than these Catholic orders, but they actually opened the very first surgical hospital for women some five years before even St. Michael's opened its door. 
This Anglican order of nuns was established in Canada on the 8th of September, 1884, by Mother Hannah Greer Coombe, who hailed from Eastern Ontario and was the widow of an engineer. Part of her married life had been spent in England, where she had befriended the Sisters of St. Mary in Wantage. After her husband's early death, it had been her plan to return to England and join the sisters there at their convent. But at the very same, same time that she was planning on doing this, some Anglicans here in Toronto were actually raising funds to establish a convent in Toronto. And they asked Mrs. Coombe to found it here rather than return to England, and she decided to do that very thing. After taking her final vows, she and one other nun went west and they served as nurses in Moose Jaw during the Northwest Rebellion. And then after that was concluded, they returned here to Toronto in 1885. If you move to the next slide, you'll see that within months of their arrival, they acquired property at the corner of Euclid and Robinson Streets, which became that very first surgical hospital for women in Toronto. As you can imagine, their presence was a little bit controversial here, especially among many in the Protestant community. The sight of Anglican women who looked like and lived like Catholic nuns was unsettling, and members of the Orange Order, which let's remember basically ran Toronto at this period, they initially threatened to burn their convent to the ground. The sisters of St. John, however, persisted in their work of serving the poor of all faiths, and they opened a drug dispensary for the sick, they prepared hot meals for the poor, and they provided religious instruction for children. The orange men were not only won over, they in fact began to support the activities of the nuns financially. The sisters, of course, would eventually go on to run homes for the aged in the downtown area, as well as the convalescent hospital, which with they are, which with they are still uh, associated in Willowdale to this day. So if what I call the missionary period in Toronto, which was last, year, last week I said mm, ends in 1850, if that period of the missionary era was dominated by important clergymen like Bishop Strawn and Power, Edgerton Ryerson and Robert Burns, it is impossible, impossible to think of the social safety net in this city without thinking of the laity and especially the women who in large part helped to make it secure. As we have just seen, the various orders of nuns, both Catholic and Anglican, were essential to establishing health care and education for the poorest of this city. But they were far from alone in their efforts, especially as the 19th century grew older and the negative effects of industrialization and waves of refugees and immigrants stretched the charitable activities of all of the churches to their uttermost limits. If you look to the next slide, one of the first important lay groups that worked with the poor, but the critical point is they worked with the poor in their own homes. And that was the Catholic Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which was established in Toronto again in 1850, a pivotal year. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul could be found in each and every parish of the city and would collect for the needs of the poor in their own specific geographical district. This is going to have an effect not only on Catholics, but also on Protestants. The decision that was made that laity, the laity, not the clergy, should collect and distribute money, food, and clothing was crucial since it was meant to reinforce the idea that this was a matter of equals serving equals. It's a matter of dignity. It is not a matter of top-down acts of charity. From the 1860s onward, the St. Vincent de Paul Society establishes this trend and they, they start visiting the sick in their homes, supplying much needed medicines, for example, free of charge from the collections within the parish, procuring the services of doctors, dentists, and nurses, again, at no cost to the, uh, to the, uh, to the patients, because the money was collected from the parish. 
The society also found living accommodations for newcomers to Toronto, and when necessary, and it was necessary, they paid the rents. They furnished tools for workers. They provided loans to start small business ventures, and they established libraries, both to spread the faith, but also to educate the poor. What is interesting in all of this is that since serving the needs of the poor was intended to be a parish-based activity, not a diocesan one, this actually led to the establishment of new parishes, which was not the intention of the diocese in the latter part of the century. In 1885, the St. Vincent de Paul Society also founded a ladies' auxiliary to take over visitation to hospitals, which had been done by the male society members. These women would also visit female inmates in jail, support them when they had their court appearances, and once released, help them to readjust socially to life on the outside. This is all well before the turn of the 20th century. But these Catholic women were not alone in providing the social assistance so desperately needed across a city that was seeing more and more slums rising, especially in and around the areas where industrialization was forcing the middle class out into the so-called suburbs, such as Swansea, leaving the poor behind in downtown Toronto. If you look at the next slide, the establishment of an order of deaconesses in the Anglican, Presbyterian, and Methodist churches was critical to carrying out this vital social work. The deaconess movement first emerged in, emerged in Germany in the 1830s, and in England, the first institutions appeared in, in the 1860s to train women for missionary service, which, which meant much more than going to far off Africa or running nursery schools for children, although this was also part of their mandate. If you look to the next slide, you'll see the Church of England Deaconess and Missionary Training Home was established here in Toronto in 1890 as a residential school to prepare women workers for service at home and abroad. One of the things I find interesting about that image, those women all appear to be wearing clerical collars, almost all of them with the exception I think of two. So I'm not sure if that was intentional or if that was just the dress of the day, but you don't see that with the Methodists and the Presbyterians. Speaking of which, if we move to the next slide, you'll see the Methodist deaconess home and training school did exactly the same thing as the Anglicans, opening their first classes for women in 1894. If you look to the next slide, you'll see a very, very happy looking group of Presbyterian women these are the Ewart Missionary Training Home Women for the Presbyterian Church, which opened in 1897. The program for Methodist women gave as one important option for them to train as nurses under a head nurse in a hospital somewhere in the city in order to choose whether or not to work here in the city or go off to foreign missions. But the important point is that home missions are now seen as essential. It's interesting that for the Methodists, their courses were taught at the University of Toronto. They were taught through Victoria College, through Knox College, the Faculty of Medicine, the Faculty of Music, and once it was established in 1914, these Methodist deaconesses studied at the Faculty of Social Work. What this speaks to is the growing professionalization of the deaconesses work in Toronto. The Presbyterian deaconesses in training were originally offered a six month introductory program which was later expanded to a year which prepared them for work in the foreign missions or again to stay on the home front because this was now seen as mission territory. Eventually they took the lead from their Methodist sisters by taking courses from the Faculty of Music in order to learn voice training and elocution, which would be important for what they were trying to accomplish. Eventually, these Presbyterian women, and this is kind of shocking for the day, they were admitted to classes with their male counterparts who were studying for ministry at Knox College. So in the seminary, 
And they were also trained not only in terms of nursing and elocution, but also were trained in terms of theology and scripture, as well as social services. As we move into the 1880s, there is a seismic shift that is about to happen among Christians with regards to our collective responsibility to build that social safety net. And that's not only here in Toronto, but is all around the globe. If you look to the next slide, a movement called the Social Gospel, which had begun in Europe in the mid-19th century, it began to have a direct effect on Protestant outreach to the poor here in Toronto, especially among the Methodists by the 1880s, 1890s. They began to recognize that the, the wide variety of social ills that the churches were facing at the time, such as economic equality, poverty, alcoholism, crime, racial tensions, the growth of large slums in urban areas, unhealthy environments, the use of child labor, a decline in childhood education, these were all largely the result of rapid and rampant industrialization combined with liberal capitalism's focus on individual enrichment as opposed to communal progress. Social gospel Protestants, they did believe that humans are saved by Christ alone, but and this is the big change, they also argued that you could not be saved without doing the works of charity and mercy that Christ demanded. To honor God, they argued, Christian people must put aside self-interest, which we have to admit was one of the principal hallmarks of industrialization, and help others as a matter of justice, not as a matter of charity. This is a huge change in the way in which you view the poor. Wealth was not meant to be amassed and hoarded, but was meant to be shared for the good of all community members in keeping with what Christ taught us in the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. If you look to the next slide, which admittedly is a cartoon, the social gospel movement not only questioned the claims of liberal capitalism and industrialization, but it also attacked the concept of social Darwinism, which spoke of the survival of the fittest in society, saying that this was contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ, since the social Darwinism obviously favored the powerful and the rich over the poor. Moving to the next slide, at this very same time, a new sense of social justice was starting to emerge within Roman Catholicism, approached admittedly from a slightly different angle, but arriving at exactly the same conclusion, that society needed to return to a sense of natural justice for all, for all, if true progress was going to be achieved. These ideas reached their zenith in the papal encyclical Rerum Novarum, issued by Pope Leo XIII in 1891, which supported the rights of laborers to form unions, which was considered a radical idea at the time. It rejected unrestricted capitalism, and it demanded that the misery and wretchedness pressing so unjustly on the majority of working classes be improved. And moving on, as I said, the Methodists were the very first to embrace the idea of Toronto as missionary territory, and they especially looked to their deaconesses to work on behalf of the poor who were living in this city. The Methodist training curriculum that emerged at Victoria College required training in what they called applied Christianity, which effectively meant being schooled in social gospel theology, as well as taking courses on how to develop and implement social reform. They also had to take a course, interestingly enough, at the turn of the century, on women's leadership. By 1914, the end of the period that we are considering in this lecture series, the Methodists were turning their deaconesses into professional women by having them enroll in courses taught at the new Department of Social Work at the University of Toronto. Moving on to the next slide, re returning to the concerns that were first seen in the 1830s with the St. George's, St. David's, and St. Patrick's societies, 
The deaconesses were particularly active in the settlement of immigrants, who by the turn of the 20th century were now not only coming in large numbers from Britain, but more importantly now, from Southern and Eastern Europe, and they were settling in downtown Toronto in the area of the poorest of the poor. By the end of the First World War, the Presbyterian deaconesses were doing the very same work in industrial schools. They were working with prisoners and they were acting as advocates in juvenile courts. Looking at the next image, the effects of industrialization were also becoming a prime concern for many of the Anglican rectors who were living and working in downtown Toronto. As the 19th turned into the 20th century, they, like their Catholic, Methodist, and Presbyterian counterparts, were doing what they could to counter the negative effects of rampant industrialization in the city and meet the increasing needs of the poor who had been left behind, as I said, as more and more middle-class families moved to quote-unquote better neighborhoods on the outskirts of Toronto. Looking to the next slide, relief of the Anglican poor was originally undertaken at the parish level, much as it had been done back in the old country. And just as an example, at the Church of the Ascension in the city's East End, the Reverend H.C. Dixon provided free Sunday morning breakfast for the poor of the neighborhood. Out of this eventually grew a lodging house for the East End's homeless, which he opened in 1890. Somewhat ahead of his time, Dixon worked in conjunction with other Protestants in the city and not just Anglicans to improve the living conditions of the growing number of poor in Toronto. Moving on to the next, we can see that one initiative that grew out of this ecumenical push was the Toronto Mission Union, a Protestant interdenominational group that was begun in 1885 which sought to reach the poor and neglected through Bible classes, yes indeed, but also through storefront soup kitchens and a nursing at home branch with a superintendent and 10 nurses who were ministering to the poor free of charge. This group also operated a surgery and a dispensary free of charge with a staff of 10 doctors. Anglican efforts for poor relief, however, were still largely confined to activities at the parish level well into the 20th century. If you look at the next picture, you can see an example of the lengths to which some ministers went when, for example, after he became rector of Little Trinity Church on King Street, Reverend Dixon, who was the one that had that breakfast program for the poor, he turned Little Trinity Rectory into a storehouse rather than a home. It was a storehouse for food and clothing for the needy of the East End of Toronto. But this kind of piecemeal, parish by parish solution to common problems, it was no longer enough to meet the challenges that were being faced in the inner city by the rectors, pastors, priests, and ministers. The problems only grew and grew and grew. And eventually, it led to the rectors of the downtown Anglican parishes finally to coming together in the spring of 1912 to figure out how they could address the many social pro uh, problems that they were encountering on a regular basis in a much more coordinated and collective manner. And the result was the foundation of what was called the Downtown Church Workers Association. Their job was to help the Anglican parishes create a social assistant program and train parish volunteers to administer it. Looking at the next slide, this group of Anglican priests, they organized clothing and food drives, but perhaps more importantly, among other things, they originally erected a tent in Memorial Park, which was part of the old St. John's Garrison Church near Fort York, and it was there that they hosted a well baby clinic overseen by Toronto Public Health nurses. A free walking clinic and a dispensary continued at St. John's Garrison Church into the second half of the 20th century. 
Looking to the next image, you can see that this, this group of Anglican downtown workers also organized the first fresh air camps. And these still exist to this day, administered now by the Toronto Star, which saw the poor board trains and buses and get taken away from downtown Toronto out into the country, away from the city's growing pollution problems, even if it was only for a single day. You see, the spread of the social gospel among Protestants and the papal social teaching among Catholics was causing a seismic shift in religious Toronto, and it was challenging the status quo with regards to the way in which we leave, way in which we relieve the problems of the poor. A change of attitude was now in the air, and it was going to make a huge difference in the way that churches would tackle the problems that they were facing. When you think about it, to this point, from the time in 1813, when the first St. James Anglican Church was turned into a field hospital to care for wounded soldiers injured at the Battle of York, from that time, Toronto Christians had been dealing with problems as they arose on a case-by-case -case basis. Famine immigrants, poverty, prostitution, illiteracy, truancy, alcoholism. The churches were effectively part of a game of whack-a-mole that tried to face down each social issue as it surfaced. For the most part, however, Christians were dealing with the symptoms of much bigger problems, especially as increased immigration and rampant industrialization gripped Toronto. If you look to the next slide, by the end of the 19th century, there were at least 19 large and small areas, streets or neighborhoods, that had been designated by the city as slums. The worst being the area around where the new city hall now stands, which was called the Ward. It had been home to, among others, the city's first black population, which numbered by the mid-1850s about a thousand souls, a thousand black souls. They had been, begun immigrating to Toronto here principally from the United States after the War of 1812, but especially in the years leading up to the American Civil War. If you look, turn to the next slide, you'll see that by the mid-century, the back, black population in Toronto already had four churches in town. Two were African Baptist, and two were Methodist Episcopal churches. And you can see here one sketch of the pastor from Center Street African Methodist Episcopal Church, a sketch that was done in 1855. We just acquired, or I shouldn't say we now since I'm retired, but the library acquired, this is one of my last purchases for the library, was this wonderful set of water, watercolors. And when we showed this to some scholars here in Toronto and, and, and other parts of Ontario um, who were looking for early examples of uh, the black population in Toronto, they said these images are in fact the earliest witnesses that we have in art of the black population in the city of Toronto. Some of the images you may find, I have to admit, I find a little offensive. They tend to infantilize the black population. Nevertheless, what it does do is show us that they were here, that they were contributing to this society. Not surprisingly, the black laborers that you see depicted here, they worked in lower paid positions, they struggled to make ends meet, and they were not universally greeted with wild enthusiasm by the white population. Nevertheless, Toronto schools and Toronto churches in the mid-19th century were among the only ones in Upper Canada that did not segregate. If you look to the next population, you can see a, a map of, of the city. And we have actu we've, we've actually eliminated the term that is used. If you look towards the top, you will see a mean area of the city. It's, uh, it's by Center Street, I think. It's uh, Young and, and Elm around there. This describes the area where the black population lived in large population. Uh, we blacked it out, but it does give the indication uh, that um, certainly they weren't always welcome in this, in this city. 
The black congregations became centers for social welfare for their own people, and they also hosted abolitionist lecturers, including Frederick Douglass, in the years before the American Civil War. But as the century wore on, clergy and laity of all religious backgrounds were finding it harder and harder to keep up with the demands from places like the ward where destitution was rampant. It was at this point that the various denominations began to realize several things. First of all, we have to stop focusing on the symptoms of problems and start attacking the problems themselves, which were the social and economic systems that allowed poverty to flourish in Toronto in the first place. This meant, therefore, that the, the distribution of charity, as important as that would continue to be, had to start giving way to a coordinated fight for social justice at the political level. That then meant that the religious groups, which had been providing the majority of direct aid to the city's poor, had to cooperate with each other, no matter what that denomination might be. If you move to the next slide, at the turn of the 20th century, some of the Anglican clergy in Toronto began to challenge the accepted model that to this point had been treating those symptoms of the wider social problems. The Reverend E.C. Cayley, for example, he challenged the law of competition and liberal capitalism, which obviously dominated business here in Toronto, and he had the temerity to preach on these very topics to his rather tony congregation at St. Simon's in South Rosedale, home to several of the industrialists who had been keeping operations humming in this city. Another Anglican priest, the Reverend Septimus Jones, the rector of the Church of the Redeemer at the corner of Avenue Road and Bloor, he joined the Christian Social Union and encouraged the members of his deanery to address the problems of the day in a more meaningful way than simply just doling out charity. The Christian Social Union had been founded in Oxford in 1889, and it was open to clergy and laity alike. Its Canadian members dedicated themselves to studying the causes of social conditions underlying the rampant poverty in cities like Toronto, and then sought to mobilize the public in their parishes to redress the circumstances that were leading to poverty in the first place. If you move on, you can see that, as you can imagine, this form of Christian socialism, which is an early form of socialism, it was not popular with all of the businessmen who ran this city. People like the Methodist Timothy Eaton, the Presbyterian Robert Simpson, and the Anglican George Goodrum. Even within the church's clergy, there was opposition, or at least suspicion, of this new Christian socialism. Canon Henry Cody, once rector of St. Paul's Bloor Street and president of the University of Toronto from 1932 to 44, he actively discouraged Anglican clergy from getting involved, advising them to avoid, quote, leaping into the arena of practical politics on active economic and industrial questions. Your place is in the pulpit. Among Catholics in Toronto, things were slightly different. There were certainly fewer Roman Catholics who were running businesses or actively involved in politics in Toronto at the end of the 19th century, so that meant that there were fewer members of the Catholic faith who would be offended by advocating for Christian socialism or calling for improved living standards for the poor. If you look to the next slide, you can see that by the 1870s, Archbishop John Lynch and his Catholic clergy, they were well aware of the problems that industrialization was causing for their Catholic flock. Their parishioners tended to be in lower paid manual labor positions. Alcoholism was a serious issue across the archdiocese as were large families living at subsistent levels in neighborhoods that were prone to disease and crime. While Lynch and his priests and his nuns worked tirelessly to address the effects of industrialization, they really didn't understand the trajectory of industrialization any better than Protestants had been doing that at the same time. So while Archbishop Lynch gave tacit approval to Catholic workers doing things like organizing themselves into unions and negotiating units like the Knights of Labor, 
He, in fact, did nothing when the rubber hit the road and they needed his actual support on the rare occasions that they did take job actions, such as during the streetcar strike of 1886. Scholars describe this period of official inaction at the turn of the 20th century as a time of benign neglect, effectively leaving most everything to the lay organizations that had been supplying the immediate wants of the poor as they had been for the last 50 years without ever tackling the root causes of these problems. If we look to the next slide, it would only be with the appointment of Archbishop Neil McNeil to the Toronto Catholic Archdiocese in 1912 that things would change rapidly and dramatically, and not only for the Catholic Church and its social services, but for all religious backgrounds here in the city working for social justice. McNeil had hailed from Nova Scotia. Before coming to Toronto, he had been Archbishop of Vancouver for two years. He had studied in Rome in the 1870s, just at that time when social action was starting to emerge in Europe, and McNeil was a convinced advocate. In his initial address to the Catholics of Toronto, he said, the Catholic Church calls upon us to enlarge our hearts and to widen our horizon. If we are wanting in Catholic charity, we can make it seem that we have no part in the upbuilding of this great nation, as if we are innately selfish, looking after local and small issues. If, however, we are apostolic in our faith and practice, we can Christianize and set aside conflicts between capital and labor and such problems. The power of Christian charity is great enough to do this. This attitude, it represented a sea change in Catholic thought in Toronto with regards to social action. But perhaps even more importantly, McNeil insisted, after years of the Catholic Church operating in Toronto within a silo, that Catholics had to collaborate with non-Catholics to achieve the social improvements necessary to build up this city, this province, and this country. Looking at the next slide, McNeil spoke for those of all faiths who wanted to see a more just society established in Toronto when he said that social work comprehends not only the care of those in actual want and distress, but the prevention of causes of want and distress and the pr pr uh, promotion of rehabilitations physically, morally, and vocationally of those who come within the range of charitable activities. Social Catholicism finds its best expression in promoting those measure, measures that prevent unemployment or ensure against since such periods, in safeguarding against and building up resistance to occasions of accident and illness, in reinforcing by religious and moral power the resistance to vice and family breakdowns. It deals with the stability of society by such means as thrift, social insurance against accidents, sickness, unemployment, old age, employment bureaus, a living wage, institutions for safeguarding savings and loaning money on charitable collateral. This was radical stuff at the beginning of the 20th century. In these sentiments, he was joined by the clergy of all denominations in Toronto who were feeling exhausted by the burden that social relief had been placing on individual parishes and religious organizations. What McNeil was calling for was a more just society in which government and churches would work together, something that we are the heirs of today in a project that is still being realized. Moving on then, by 1914, the end of this period that we have been considering in these lectures, it had become clear that in order to achieve the elusive goal of social justice, Christian organizations could not work in isolated splendor or in silos any longer. To that end, Archbishop McNeil established the Office for Catholic Charities to coordinate the many Catholic groups operating in Toronto, 
while Protestants formed the Neighborhood Workers Association to centralize their agencies as well. True to McNeil's hope, the two did work together as the social services directories for the period demonstrate. I would suggest that Archbishop McNeil's greatest legacy was after he died, the tributes that he received. In 1934, after his death, the Right Reverend Dr. Albert Moore, the moderator of the United Church of Canada, said of him, His Grace Archbishop Neil McNeil was held in the high esteem of the people of Canada, irrespective of creed or nationality. The Archbishop was ever mindful of the general good of all citizens and united in cordial cooperation in many movements which churchmen of other faith wrought side by side for the improvement of the like conditions of the people. He was worthy of the highest tributes of respect and the confidence and affection of the people of all faiths and forms of worship. Over these last three weeks, we have been looking at the ways in which Christians in Toronto's early period influenced our city's culture, which we still live with today. This period is known by historians as the long 19th century, and it covers the period from 1792, the end of the French Revolution, to 1914, the start of World War I. I have scarcely scratched the surface. If you move on, what has been left unmentioned are such organizations that the church has established here in Toronto to support the poor, immigrants, the elderly, children, and refugees, such as the Widow and Orphans Fund, founded by the Anglican Church, the Catholic Children's Aid Society, Belmont Houses for the Ages, Aged, founded by the Anglican Church in 1852, the Sisters of St. John the Divine's Church Home for the Aged, the Methodist Earl's Court Children's Home, the Fred Victor Mission for the Destitute, also run by the Methodists and still to this day by the United Church of Canada, the Good, Refuge, the Good Shepherd Refuge for Women Released from Prisons, originally run by the Sisters of Charity and none now operated as a, a point of contact for the, for the destitute in downtown Toronto by the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd, the Haven and Prison Gate Mission an evangelical enterprise caring for released female prisoners and their families, the home for homeless children run by the Carmelite nuns, the Humewood House for Unwed, Unwed Mothers founded by a group of laywomen from St. Thomas's Anglican Church on Huron Street, the Methodist Mothers Pension Committee, which lobbied politicians for a mother's allowance across the province, which eventually we achieved nationally, the St. Elizabeth Visiting Nurses, who brought health care to the poor in their own homes. The list goes on and on of efforts by Christians to ensure that the social safety net, such as it was, caught as many people as possible in difficult times. As the First World War approached, it was clear that all of the churches were arriving at the same conclusion, that these things should not be seen so much as works of charity extended by the haves to the have-nots, they must be seen as works of justice to change society in keeping with the teachings of Christ himself. As their heirs, I am certainly proud of the work that the Christians of this city continue to do to meet the needs of the less fortunate, but I am also proud of the way in which we continue to keep the government's heels to the fire to ensure that proper care is not just a matter of charity, but is a matter of legislation. No one denomination, however, could have done all of this on its own. What was required was a spirit of cooperation among all the Christians who helped to build the city, a spirit that has emerged over the past 200 years here in Toronto, the meeting place. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, yet again, a third uh, series. We've uh, been delighted to learn so much from you over these past three weeks. We're just uh, so grateful. Um,
entertain a couple of questions, uh, either about uh, the topic tonight or any of the three sessions. I think, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just wondering when um, the government started getting involved. Well, I mean, it's at different points, right, over the, over the course. Okay. There was never a time that the government wasn't involved. Okay. But in terms of direct action, it very much fell to the churches, as we have seen uh, right. throughout. But, I mean, as early as the 1830s, the, church, the, the government is, is starting to do things like trying to establish these houses of industry. Um, but when you think about things like, for example, healthcare, all the way through this, it's been, you know, the Sisters of St. John the Divine, the Sisters of St. Joseph, you know, the various uh, congregations that are, are, are doing free medical care. Well, as you and I both know, free medical care, quote unquote, free medical care doesn't come to Canada until, what, 1960 something. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's one of these things that, that the government gets involved at different times depending on what it is. Um, some things they will deal with in terms of the Criminal Code of Canada, like that's how they will deal with prostitution, right? Whereas you've got the Sisters of the Good Shepherd who are dealing with prostitution immediately in the 1850s, 1860s. It, it's, it's a very piecemeal reaction to, to uh, what is going on, but very much... I think when, when you study it, you see the government responds directly to the challenges that are being made by the churches who are saying this, it's not just the symptom, this has to be dealt with, whatever the, whatever the particular social issue is, at a legislative manner. And that's, as I say, from the 1830s right through to today, really. But we, the churches... We can be very proud of the role that we have played and continue to play in holding the churches, uh, the government responsible. Thank you. I just wanted to mention this extraordinary monument in, to the Irish immigrants that's down at the waterfront behind some silos. That's right. You could easily miss it. It's magnificent. It's, it's just breathtaking. It is. And, and, and its, it's mate is, is over on the west coast of Ireland. So you have the figures on the west coast of Ireland are pointing towards Toronto, and you have the Toronto Irish immigrants pointing back. Um, I hope that that park will improve, because it's, it's not easy to find. It is. Oh, it is. They're, 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 it is an amazing memorial. And this one to Dr. Gossett is also quite, it's a very modern memorial, but it's, it's worth looking at as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's an amazing story when you think of how it, the, the Irish immigration transformed Toronto. I mean, can you imagine that more people immigrated than were already living in your city? It's frightening yeah. to think of it. Yeah, absolutely frightening. Um, yeah, thank, a word of thanks to uh, Professor Carefoot and the Paris uh, coordinator, education coordinator, William Cowling. Um, two questions. Uh, where is the Toronto industry of house you know, on page three? You, you know, I think the building still stands. If oh. I'm not mistaken, the building still stands. It's, is it on Elm Street? I want to say it's on Elm Street. Um, it, you, if, if, you, if you just Google it, if you, if you Google Toronto House of Industry, it, it will show you the building. And I'm pretty certain part of it is still standing. But it's right in the downtown. I, I want to say Elm, but I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain of that. Oh, the, the second one is uh, comparing countries. It sounds like... What are, what are the, your, your views of the two offers um, of the early church in Toronto by Grace co-workers? And, uh, and the second book, Extraordinaires by Father Seamus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are your views, Professor? Yeah. What? what? Uh, compare and contrast the two. Oh, books. I haven't read the second one. I've only read by Grace Coworkers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, it was, it was, it's an excellent uh, description of how the Anglican Church in Toronto uh, evolved. Um, there, there are some excellent ones for, well, all the, all the denominations have some great 
books on the history of, of the church in Toronto as it, at, that were published towards the end of the ninth towards the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. But by Grace Coworkers, um, was edited by the, the Dean of, of Wycliffe, who is no slouch when it comes to, to history. It's, it's an excellent book, but I haven't, read, I haven't read the other one that you mentioned. Yeah. Where was, uh, the, was the uh, Proven House of Providence, where was that located? The House of like Providence was originally located now where the Gardner Express, Expressway hits, um, you know, when you, when you, the off-ramp from the Gardner Expressway uh, comes down to um, uh, like t towards uh, it's um, Richmond. Is it Richmond Street? The, is it Richmond the off ramp that comes where, down? Where you see that? Where you see that weird kind of modern building? There's like yeah. It, so, it's, so if you take that yeah. off ramp and come down that one that's kind of a cube on its yeah. side, yeah. where it where that off ramp meets the road. That's where the original House of Providence stood. It was a magnificent building. It it's looked another, really grand. Yeah. another lost magnificent building. Um, the, House of Pro the Houses of Providence now, of course, are still going. Um, they're out in, at Warden and St. Clair, and uh, they're, they're huge, still, still a huge enterprise. But the original one was there at um, where the off-ramp hits, hits, hits the road. It was, on, it was uh, at Power and Duchess. Duchess doesn't exist as a street anymore. But a magnificent building, magnificent building, sadly. <laughs> Another one gone. <laughs> William, did you want to say anything? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the rector and parish of St. Olaves, thank you, Dr. Carefort, for a most wonderful series. It's just tremendous. It's so well thought out and so well presented, it had us captivated. We have a small thank you gift. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you all came out, and I'm glad for the people that uh, we've been able to connect with. Thank you. It's very kind. The people we've connected with uh, on the internet as well, uh, some of whom have been sending me emails, which is quite nice. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Well, much appreciated. Good public education. So the next event in this series is in about two and a half weeks, and it's as we continue to mark the Queen's uh, Jubilee, the Platinum Jubilee, we have a service of Evensong at four o'clock on the 5th of June, that's the Sunday, uh, followed by a words and music event in honor of the Queen. So hope you can join us for that. So Sunday afternoon, the 5th of June. So I say